Hi, and welcome to our session on top three tips for designing your App Exchange app. My name is Lynn Cohen, and I'm an ISV technical evangelist. I work with partners in the life sciences, healthcare, and consumer packaged goods industries. Please remember this Twitter handle because I will be posting the link to my slides with speaker notes so you don't have to worry about taking pictures or notes during the session. I'm only going to be talking about GA features today, but if for any reason we veer off into anything on the roadmap, just remember, make decisions based on what's currently available. Before I dig in, I have two questions for you. How many of you already have an app on AppExchange? About seven. How many of you are thinking about building an app for AppExchange? Okay, that's most of you, maybe 20 or so. Well, fantastic. It really doesn't matter if you're in either category, if your app's already out there or you're planning it. These tips will be good for you because they are real life from partners who have had apps in the market for a while. I worked with my colleagues in the TE team, the technical evangelist team, to reach out to top partners and find out, knowing what they know now, what tips would they share with you in the partner community? I received a ton of tips, but the three that came up the most often had to do with avoiding app dependencies that would limit your target market, ensuring your subscribers can customize your app, and implementing custom app logging. So those are the three we're going to go through today. This first tip about avoiding app dependencies is mainly for those of you who are building ISV Force apps. Those are apps that you intend to have installed into existing customer orgs. However, those of you, okay, what happened? You gotta enter the password. Am I in the Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> As I was saying, it's mainly for those of you who are ISV Force partners. But those of you who are OEM partners, consider this tip as well because we're seeing more and more demand for OEM apps to be installed into the existing orgs. So what is the issue with app dependencies? When your app is installed into a subscriber org, you might be dealing with any one of the additions that are available, like um, unlimited or enterprise or professional, or older additions that we still support that we don't sell. All of these additions have differences in the features that are available. For example, the professional edition does not have sales teams or visual workflows. And those are things you need to be aware of as you design your app. Also, those additions, even though they have features available, your subscribers may not turn on all those features. And you need to be aware of which features in additions are optional so that you don't have unintentional dependencies that could limit your target market. There's a link so you can go and study all the differences in the additions on your own to dig more deeply, but some example optional features depending on the addition that you have are things like account teams, person accounts, chatter, communities. Platform encryption and CTI are two examples of features that cost extra, and your, your customers may not have purchased those. If you were to build a managed package that has a dependency on one of these types of optional features, your package would not install if the, your customers have not enabled that feature. Here's a real simple example. Well, I'll just ignore that. Um, here's a real simple example of Chatter where we have a after insert and after update trigger on feed item. Feed item is a Chatter object. The use case here is to scan posts for keywords or phrases and map that to business processes that have been predefined. I have a partner in life sciences that has this exact use cases. 
they scan for keywords that are associated with legal holds, and that information has to be retained for a long period of time. Well, the issue is, if you were to package that code, that trigger, then that package get installed into an org where chatter is not enabled, your subscriber is going to hit an error when they try to install that package. So what can you do to avoid these dependencies? Well, be sure that you put generic logic related to your features in utility classes that only depend on the generic S objects or primitive types, not these objects that are part of optional features. And think about, are there ways to deliver features without those dependencies? Can you do that? It, maybe with quick actions, you could have a similar type of feature to Im implementing it directly in Chatter. Then for those optional features that you do want to support, you can deliver support for those separately from your core app. Like you could use an extension app, or you could have instructions in your implementation guide that says how to hook up your features to Chatter. Also, you need to detect dependencies as you test, as you prep your package. I mean, there are things that you need to do in the design of your code that we just looked at. How you design your code is going to make it more resilient. But you also need to be looking at all the ways you can detect dependencies. When you package your code, the package manager will show you a report of the dependencies that it finds. So that's a really easy, quick way to find the dependencies and then plan around them. Also, be sure that you test your app and all the different additions you intend to support. And be sure in those additions, you disable those optional features so that you can test your package install. If you go through all this, you will have the benefits of being able to target more types of additions without dependencies, and you'll have smoother installations. One quick aside, you might be wondering about Lightning. Lightning is an optional thing for your subscribers to turn on or not. However, the good news is you can package Lightning features like components or Lightning pages. And you won't run into install issues. So do build for Lightning. Be sure to test in Classic, because you want to make sure your app is useful for those uh, subscribers who are still in Classic. But you don't have to worry about installation issues. OK, if you followed the first tip, you've been able to have your package installed successfully into your subscriber's org. Once it's installed, their admin is going to want to customize your app, just like they customize Sales and Service Cloud. So you want to make sure your subscribers can customize your app. Also, your subscribers are going to surprise you and customize your app in ways you can't imagine. So you, you want to have some general principles in play to help you make your app really resilient. And two key goals that you want to strive for is to make sure that your app design works in the presence of customizations. You don't want your users' customizations to break your app. Also, you want to have an app design that does not restrict what your customers can do. And we're going to look at two examples of how you could run into these problems. The first one is called field shadowing, and the other one is going to be related to field sets. OK, so what is field shadowing? How many of you have even heard of field shadowing? Uh, all right, so this is a tricky one. Field shadowing is something that happens in Apex, and it occurs when your subscriber creates a custom field on one of your objects that's the same name as one of your custom fields. And in Apex, if you use dynamic SQL to query that local field, what happens is the query engine that's part of our database will automatically resolve the name of that local field to the namespaced name in your package. This only happens within the context of your managed package, not for your end user, if they were to write their own custom code. But in the context of your namespace, it's always going to resolve that local field name to your namespaced name. And you can't do anything about that. It's just the way the platform works. There's a link here with more information about this. 
there's an even uh, beyond just shadowing, there's actually an issue that you can run into. If you were to try to run the query that's on this slide, what would happen is you'd get a database exception because the query engine has resolved that local name to the namespace name, and now you're querying the same field twice. That is not allowed in SQL. You'll get a database exception with this query. So this is sticky. This is a sticky issue to get around, but there is a way to solve this problem, and that is to use a naming convention. Come up with a prefix that is so unique and specific to your app that it's unlikely that your customers are going to use it in the naming of their custom fields and add that prefix into the name of all of your custom fields. Now, yes, that's going to mean your package fields have two prefixes, but this is going to help you avoid the field shadowing problem if you have a lot of Apex and you need to use dynamic SQL. Be sure you tell your subscribers about these conventions so that they don't accidentally see your naming convention and see it's a great idea and do it themselves and then you're back to the problem you were trying to avoid. Let's take a quick look at a demo of how this works. All right, this is a subscriber org where I've installed a package and this is a object called SQL EX, this package. You'll see there's two package fields, A field and B field. A field is just named normally without the extra prefix. B field has this extra prefix that I defined. And in the subscriber org, there are two local fields, A field and B field, so we can see how they conflict or not. I've created a couple of records of data to illustrate what happens with the different queries. You'll see I have values A1, B1 for the package fields, and then I have some text so that I can tell when I get the values back for the local fields. I, local field value, local field value here. Lastly, I have a very simple lightning component that just displays the outputs of some queries. First, you'll see I'm using describe to pull out the names of all the fields for this object, except for the system fields, I exclude those. The first query I have here is querying all the fields, ID name, package fields, local fields. Look what happens. I get a database exception because this A field, local, is being converted to the namespace name, and now I'm trying to select the same field twice. I get a database exception. The next example, I'm just querying the namespaced package fields. No problem. I get the values back that I expect. But notice the last example where I see shadowing for A field. Here, I'm trying to select the two local fields. The query engine, however, is resolving A field to the namespace name. And look, I'm getting back that package field value. But the B field, where I added the additional prefix, is not an issue because the name is not the same as my doubly prefix field. If you want to explore this demo further, um, I've provided a link to the controller code. OK, field sets. What's the issue with field sets? Field sets are awesome. They're a way for you to give your customers uh, the opportunity to pick which fields they want to show up in your custom UIs. Well, I had a partner who had an issue here where they had a lot of custom UIs and they were using field sets to give the user customization control, but they were hard coding the name of the field set in their Apex code. That's, that's okay for most cases, but they ran into a problem when customers wanted to include record types into the field sets. Well, there's a limitation with field sets that if you have a package field set and the object that it's for does not have a record type, your subscriber cannot add a local record type and add it to the field set. It just isn't, a, that option's not available. So you would think, well, maybe the fix is to add a record type to the packaged object, and now it's available. Well, that causes its own problems because your customers may not want record types. Um, and there's a number of reasons why you might not want to define a record type, and you want to let your subscribers pick and choose whether they want record types and what they are. So how do we get around this issue? Well, there's a much better pattern for how to use field sets than to hard code them in your Apex, and that is to use custom metadata so that you can provide UI settings 
that your subscribers can change to be what they want to be. So by all means, package a default field set, but avoid record types, and then provide custom metadata and custom metadata records that point to those defaults, but let your subscribers change those values to select their own field set where they can do whatever they want. Let's take another look at a demo. All right. Back in the same subscriber org, I've got another object called coupon. You'll notice there's a bunch of fields that are namespace, that are packaged. There's one local field called a local field, and there's a locally defined record type. Let's look at the field set that was packaged for this object. It's called coupon field sets. When I go in and edit that field set, notice that record type does not show up but the local field does. So it works really well for most use cases, but not for record types. However, if I go into the locally defined field set, I have record type available, and I as a subscriber can pick and choose whatever fields I want of my local and packaged fields. Now, I've defined custom metadata to allow the subscriber to pick which field set they want. Right now, it's set to the packaged field set and if I look at, again, a very simple lightning component to illustrate, I look at the metadata record, I find out which field set to use as a packaged one, and you see all the fields that were selected by the user. But I can go in and edit this field set and say, no, I want you to use my local one. And now the apex in my controller for this lightning component We'll go and pick up the different field set, and now I have available the record type that the subscriber wanted to add. Again, I've provided the controller code through this link. So the general recommendation here, you've seen some of the sticky situations you can get into if you don't plan ahead and understand what your customers want to do with your app. So you need to think about how do you design your app so that you avoid these situations. You have to understand what customizations will your customers want to do. So a good place to start is think about how people um, customize sales and service cloud. Think about from the admin perspective, what can, you, what can a customer do with other types of apps and plan with that in mind. Also, be sure to select pilot customers that are experienced with Salesforce if you possibly can and work with their admins and find out how they are going to want to customize your app. And then you can design for these situations ahead of time. All right, we've gone through two tips. You've successfully gotten your app installed into an org. You've successfully had an admin configure your app. They're very happy. They've ran into some issues. You, we now need to support your customers. You're probably aware that Salesforce provides system debug logs, and they're awesome for debugging issues in your subscriber's orgs. You can use the subscriber console, which is part of the license management app, to get access to those logs and use them to debug. But I have many partners who, in addition to using that out-of-the-box logging, implement their own custom app logging. In fact, I have one partner who has told me they have reduced the amount of time to find issues and resolve issues 10 times faster by having their own logging that meets their specific needs. Uh, in addition to this reduction in time to debug, they have other benefits of having their own app logging. For example, they implement their own logs for tracking performance and usage trends. They're able to use logging for additional use cases for email notifications like app-defined errors, not just exceptions, but app-defined errors. And one of the real key thing that they can use this for is more control over how long those log records are retained. You know, you're not limited by the system debug logs limits. You can do what you need to do and retain log records for longer. And that can be really helpful if you have intermittent issues or it's hard to replicate a problem. And then you can go back to those logs for whatever period of time you need to. One of my partners has a pattern for app logging similar to what's on the slide here. The, this general pattern holds for all the app logging I've seen. You need an object to hold the records. You need a class to implement the logging logic. 
And then you pick and choose where in the code you want to put the logging um, calls. They also use custom metadata. Again, remember configuration. You want to allow your customers to do things like filter what kind of logs they want to record and who do they want email notifications to go to or not, maybe turn notifications on and off. But they use standard reports and analytics to simplify the implementation and speed up the implementation of, the, of their logging. Here's a real simple use case. This is a life sciences use case where we're enrolling subjects in a clinical trial. So the requirements were to, once you prepare the enrollment information for a subject, to log something about that as an informational message. Then when we have exceptions, to capture information about the error and log it, and you'll see the true is the last parameter. That means send a notification about this particular log message. So consider using app logging. It can help you to streamline and improve your support processes. Don't forget, always, always allow your customers to subscribe the features in your app. Don't, however, implement an archival strategy. There are so many options for archival, and it's certain that whatever you choose, what you think is best, is not going to be what your customers want. So instead, work with your customers so they understand your logging implementation, you know, how it's going to grow over time, help them make decisions on their archival strategy. And lastly, be sure you get your subscribers' permission to access this data. And you, then you can use a subscriber console to access the data or perhaps build your own tools. So in summary, top three tips for you. Think about how to design your app so that you avoid unintended dependencies. Number two, design with your administrator in mind. They are a very important persona in the planning of your app. And don't forget to consider implementing custom app logging so that you can streamline your support. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Yes, the question was, does the app logging that we discussed impact storage? And yes, it does, because you're going to be storing records into an, an object. Yes, uh, the question was, how would you t deal with purging the records? That would be part of the archival strategy. So you would want to work with your customer to figure out what the volume is going to be, where do they want records stored or not, things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I'm going to tweet the link for this presentation. It was at SL Cohen. Let me go back to the start. Here we go. Or email me. Feel free to email me as well. But I will tweet a link out to this. And it'll have speaker notes and the links to all those um, controls. Yep, that's me. Thanks. <laughs> I'll fix that. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, I'll, I'll unlock it. Yes. Oh, great question. How do you get access to the different kinds of orgs? How many of you know about Environment Hub? Okay, most of you. So most of the additions that you can that are current are in the Environment Hub. But if you have some customers that you know use an older edition, put in a support case so that we can help you get an addition specific to your need. But use the Environment Hub for most. No, depending on which uh, type of org you pick, some features are already enabled, but you could disable them. If you find a situation where something is enabled and you can't turn it off, again, a support case, and we can help you with that. Yes. Let me. <laughs> kind of noisy in here. State that in the app exchange, uh -huh. uh, 
stuff, but the application can still be installed. What can we do to block an addition if we say that we don't support? What can you do? The question is, what can you do to block install into an addition you don't support? Um, let me get back to the, you on that one. I, I know you could do some things in the post install script because you can check you know, those characteristics. But in the install step, I don't know of a way off the top of my head, but I'll get back to you. We're asked which addition we support. Yeah. We don't say a professional addition, it still gets installed. Yeah. Yeah. Now we get an email saying, hey, we're on. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's the something that you could you could give a warning in the post install, maybe turn it off some way in your post install to disable it, but I don't know of a way to totally block it, but I'll check into that. Great question. Any other questions? Yeah. I have, so the question was, is there a way to check if a feature is enabled and do one thing versus another? And I do have partners that do that, but it's mostly in Apex. So you, you know, if you have features that you um, want to do, if the feature is enabled or not, you can definitely do that in Apex. But if you, for example, create a dependency and something that's declarative, that's, that's hard to avoid that dependency, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's so many different, if you want to support multiple. So the simplest way to approach it is to have a core app that is usable to everybody and then do extension packages to build out from there. Yeah, and you do have to balance. I mean, sometimes, like for example, um, I have one life science partner who has an app that's all about chatter, this compliance example I gave. And they've chosen to have a app that is dependent on chatter because the whole reason for their app is managing compliance around chatter. So, you know, this isn't a 100% statement for every feature. It really depends. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all.